Welcome to the International Sunday School lesson for Sunday, December 1st, 2024. The title of this lesson in Boyd's commentary is The Ancestry of King David. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. And before we get into our lesson, let's start with the moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, be with us as we go through your word. Lord, thank you for making a way for your son, Jesus Christ, to be born and to be here and die for our sins, to redeem us and keep us. Lord, we love you, honor, and praise your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's get into our lesson, and I'll start by saying Happy Thanksgiving to each and every one of you. Our scripture this week will be coming from Ruth chapter 4, verses 9 through 17, and then we'll skip over to the New Testament in Luke chapter 3, verses 23, 31, and 32. And our main thought will be coming from Ruth chapter 4, verse 17, which says, also the neighbor woman gave him a name saying, there, there is a son born to Naomi and they shall call him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, as we do each week, we'll start with a little background. We're now in the first lesson of quarter number two in a unit titled, Jesus, the heir of David. This week's lesson is coming from the book of Ruth, as well as the book of Luke. Now, the book of Ruth offers insight narrative centered around a the theme of loyalty, love, and redemption. It recounts the story of Ruth, a Moabite widow who decided to stay with her Israelite mother-in-law, Naomi, instead of returning to her own community. This decision illustrates this profound example of faithfulness and devotion. Additionally, Ruth's story signify that its um, con contribution to the lineage of King David and ultimately connects the lineage of Jesus Christ, highlighting an important biblical story. The second part of our lesson comes from the book of Luke, who we know is written by the physician Luke and is recognized as the third gospel in the New Testament. It offers a highly uh, or richly detailed account of the life of Jesus Christ. It encompasses the significant events such as his miraculous birth, the impact of his ministry, the sacrificial death, and his glorious resurrection. The Gospel of Luke uniquely highlights Jesus' profound compassion for those who are on the fringe of society. It emphasizes his exclusive message of the kingdom of God that is open to all, especially the marginalized, the poor, and the outcasts. Now, in Luke's narrative, Jesus is portrayed as the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise to Israel, casting his divine lineage that traced all the way back to the first Jesus, whom we know as Adam. Now this lineage not only established his roots in Jewish history, but also signified his universal appeal. Now, inviting all of humanity into this relationship with God, Jesus shows us that whether you Jew or Gentile, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and anyone that believe in him shall be a part of the family. Now through this, uh, this lens of, of Luke, this gospel paints a vivid picture of a savior who cares deeply for every single individual, regardless of their social status or their background. Now, in our lesson today, it discussed the great grandmother of King David, who shares the um, same bloodline as Jesus many generations later. And this is where our lesson picks up today in Luke chapter four, verses nine and 10, which reads, and Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was uh, LMX and all that was Chilons and Malins from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malam, I have acquired as my wife to uh, perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among the brethren and from the position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. 
a little background as we go through this, Naomi, the mother-in-law of Ruth, um, decided to sell her land when she went back to Jerusalem because there was a famine in her land. Now, the first person who had the right to buy the land backed away from the deal because buying the land also required this person or this man to marry the, uh, her daughter-in-law, Ruth. But when they backed off, Boaz stepped up to fulfill a blessing that he told Naomi that God will give to her. Now, the context of this particular verse is that when Boaz, a wealthy and kind-hearted man, takes the responsibility of redeeming the land and marrying Ruth, a widow who had shown great loyalty to her mother-in-law, Naomi. This verse reflects this pivotal moment in a story as Boaz um, publicly declare his intention to not only redeem the land, but also take Ruth as his wife before the elders and the people of the town, which makes it a legal binding agreement. Now, the book of Ruth as a whole is the idea of redemption. See, Boaz, this, this kinsman, this redeemer in this case, is fulfilling the responsibility to redeem the land and keep the family line alive by marrying Ruth, who is the widow of um, Malan, the son of Naomi. Now, this act of redemption not only secures Ruth's future but it's, and, and well-being, but it also ensured this continuation of her late husband's name as well as his inheritance. That was so important because we find the bloodline of Boaz actually um, goes on to David and eventually lead to Jesus Christ. Now, in verses 11 through 13, we find here Boaz and Ruth marry, and they also conceive a son. It reads, and all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord made the woman who is coming to your home like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, and may you prosper in Ephratha and be famous in Bethlehem. May the house, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Terah born Judah because of the offspring which the Lord gave you from this young woman. So Boaz took with Ruth and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. See, there are some important points in comparison when we look here at verses 11 and 12. See, the text discussed the significance of um, Ruth and Boaz union in context of Israel's history, specifically when it referred to, for example, Ruth and Leah. They're the mother of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the phrase, the, the worthiness of um, Ephrath highlights this expectation of Boaz to honor his community and as this historic weight. Because during the ancient time, the name of Ephrath was a name for um, Bethlehem. And additionally to, to this, the desire for Boaz and Ruth to be famous in Bethlehem indicates that their union will be remembered and celebrated for ages to come as we celebrate them right now particularly as the ancestors of King David, making this moment pathetic for future generations. Now, leading to the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we know, came from the bloodline of David, but it's shown here the coming together of Ruth and Boaz produced the grandfather of David. See, this verse holds deep significance to those who study the Bible and seek to understand this overarching narrative of God's redemptive plan for all of humanity, how God used all of these people to culminate to the birth of his son, Jesus Christ, who would, who would redeem the world. Then when we look at verse um, 12, it talks about wanting Ruth and Boaz home to be like Perez, the son of Judah. See, his family was known for being strong and successful. By mentioning this, the elders had hoped Ruth and Boaz will have a strong, happy family that was filled with blessing. Now, the mission of Tamar here, the mother of Perez, is also important in history. See, um, we, we find this tale in, in the book of 
Genesis. It shows the value of faithfulness and determination. Tamar first mar married Judah's son. But when his son died, later she disguised herself as uh, a child of Judah. Now, this bold act led to the birth of um, Pharaoh and Ter. Tamar's story is about overcoming hardship and finding redemption. So by referring to Tamar, the elders recognize the difficulty that Ruth and Boaz have faced and hope for a positive outcome for them as well. So verses 11 and 12 is very, very important to the history that they were pressing upon Boaz and Ruth and trying to bless them that the same way God helped other women in the past, God will help Ruth in the birth of their son so she may carry on the bloodline that led to King David. Now, the next part of the verse, it says, of the seed of which God has given thee this young woman. This how like the blessing that's coming from God. It shows this true blessing and success come from God and God alone. See, in the book of Ruth, we see how God quietly, and this is very important, quietly guides these events and help the, um, the characters find redemption. Naomi find redemption as well as Ruth finding redemption. See, this verse reflects this belief that Ruth and Boaz's future family will be blessed and grace of God will be caring for them all along the way. And then when we move to verse um, 13, it marks the climax of this beautiful story. It's a moment of great joy and blessings as Ruth and Boaz, as they marry and uh, they're blessed with a son. This event is not just a happy ending to a love story. It also foreshadowed this greater redemption and blessing that God has in store for all of his people. See, in, in the, the central theme when we look at this story is redemption. Boaz served as a redeemer of Ruth and Naomi by rescuing them from poverty and providing for them. And this act of redemption is a foreshadowing of the ultimate redemption of Boaz's um, bloodline who leads to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the ultimate redeemer. In the New Testament, we find that Jesus is referred to as a kinsman, as a redeemer, the same type of kinsman and redeemer that Boaz was. But the difference is, while Boaz redeemed Naomi and Ruth, we find that Jesus paid the price for our sins and brought us back into right fellowship with our Father. So that means Jesus is the ultimate redeemer. Then when after they conceived, they named the child and blessed him um, in verses 14 through 17, which reads, when the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in Israel and may he be to you a restorer of life and nurturer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better than seven sons have bore him. Then Naomi took the child and led him in his, her bosom and became, began, became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave him a name saying, this is the son born to Naomi and they call him Oban. And he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. See, when we look at this in ancient um, Israelite society, the preservation of one's family line and inheritance was of the utmost importance. So by marrying Ruth, Boaz redeemed the family and the land. Boaz ensured that the name of Naomi's husband would not be forgotten and their lineage actually continued. Now, Naomi's story was a journey of loss, suffering, but ultimately redemption. See, Boaz, in, in his act here, redeemed her and redeemed the land. This means that because Naomi and Ruth were widow, widows, which means widows had it very hard back then. So the, the neighbors were saying to Naomi here, guess what? Now in your old age, having this grandson, you will have someone to take care of you. 
So this son being born significant uh, was very significant because it was uh, it means restoration and renewal that that child will bring, bring to Naomi's life as well. This foreshadowed the joy and the hope that the child will bring um, when Naomi get older and she no longer have to worry about hardship and the loss that she experienced in the past. So the phrase nourisher in thy old age emphasize that this child role as a source of care and provision for Naomi in her later years. This demonstrates the significance of this child in sustaining and supporting Naomi as she ages and bring comfort and security to her life. It's very interesting that they mention this because when you really look at this story and, and talking about the genealogy of Jesus as it led to this particular story, Boaz redeemed quite a few people here. And the son that they bore will actually help his grandmother in this time. It's amazing how God worked to bring all of these things together. In verse um, 15, it states that thy daughter-in-law, which love thee, which is better than uh, to thee than seven sons have borne him. Now, this is a very, very powerful statement. This portion serve as a testimony, first of all, to Ruth's exceptional and unwavering love for her mother-in-law, Naomi. But in ancient um, Israelite culture, having many sons was considered a great blessing and a source of security to the family. So by declaring that Ruth is better than seven sons, this verse highlights the immeasurable value of Ruth's love and loyalty for Naomi that surpasses the traditional measurement of familiar blessings. This also lets us know that God can work in any situation. When we look at this, we would think Naomi's um, blessing would have to come through having all of these sons, but her sons had passed away. Yet God found a way for her to still be blessed. And the witnesses that were there, the elders that were there, let her know that this, this daughter-in-law of yours is better than seven sons because of her faithfulness to God. God get all the glory and honor in this particular story. In fact, we find that it culminates in verse 17, which we see is um, all of these events come together and transpire throughout the book of Naomi. It climaxes right here. See, Naomi, who lost her husband and lost her two sons, had experienced a resurrection of hope and joy in the birth of her grandson. The, the women in the community recognize the significance of this birth, not just for Naomi, but for all of Israel. So they named this child Obed, meaning the servant or worshiper, as they acknowledge the connection to Jesse and the father of who's the father of David. And ultimately, the lineage that will lead to the fulfillment of God's promise to David, meaning that his bloodline would reign forever. And we know his bloodline led to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who will reign forever. Now, our lesson then jumps over to the New Testament, the book of Luke in chapter three, which actually tracks the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter three, verse 23 reads, now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as it was supposed, the son of David, the son of Heli. This verse, while seeing very Simple at first glance, but within it is a wealth of death and meaning. See, to truly understand the significance here, it's important to examine the context which appears in it, as well as the theme and the symbolism um, that it contains in this verse. See, when we look at Luke chapter 3, verse 23, it's found within a larger passage of Luke chapter 3, verse 21 through 38, which details Jesus' genealogy. See, this genealogy is unique to the gospel of Luke because it signifies the part of Jesus' identity and his mission. And it's crucial for understanding Jesus' lineage as the son of God that fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. So let's take a look at this because Luke actually connect Jesus to the story of Israelite history. It shows that he is this long awaited 
Messiah that's promised to the Jewish people. So by tracking Jesus' ancestry back to Adam, the first man, Luke's genealogy emphasized that Jesus' universal significance as the savior for all humanity. So he mentioned, he said, Jesus, and towards the end of verse 17, he said, Jesus being the son of Joseph and the son of um, Heli, this is what's so important about this, because what he's doing, he's tracking Jesus' lineage from both his father, Joseph, as well as his mother, Mary. Okay, so when we look at this, this ultimately, here's how it works. When he mentioned the son of Joseph, it's, it's, it's connect Joseph because Joseph is connected to the bloodline of David, right? So this shows that Jesus had a, it was divine. He was royal because he comes from the bloodline of Joseph, who's from the bloodline of David. But he also said the son of Heli. This is important because that symbolized the lineage of of Mary and Mary lineage was one of a priestly lineage. So the son of Joseph and the son of Heli mean that Jesus had the bloodline of David, the kingly bloodline, but also the bloodline of Heli, which is a priestly bloodline. So Jesus was both the king and the high priest. This is so important because it culminates to Jesus being all human and all God. On the human side, he's the rightful king and he's a rightful high priest. And because on the divine side, he's a son of God, he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and the priest of priests. So this genealogy that, that um, Luke presents here is extremely important. And it helped us gain a deeper appreciation for the profound truth as it conveys about Jesus being the son of God and how it fulfilled God redemptive plan for all of humanity. Our verse then skips down to verse 31 and 32, which read, the son of Mila, the son of Mina, the son of Matta, and the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obadiah, the son of Boaz, the son of Solomon, the son of Naphshon. See, in these verses, what he's doing, it ties the bloodline all the way back to the son of, Do uh, of Joseph, whom we know to be King David. See, through the Old Testament, there were numerous prophecies about the coming of the descendant of David who will reign as the righteous and the eternal king. So by Luke tracing Jesus' lineage back to David, will it demonstrate that Jesus is fulfilling these prophecies. So this served to validate Christ's human identity and the mission of the Messiah and emphasize this divine orchestration of history. See, today's lessons, brothers and sisters, serve as a testimony that uh, and the fulfillment of the prophecy, the continualities of God's plan throughout history. This symbolizes the connection between Jesus and the lineage of David, which led all the way back to Adam. Ultimately, this verse points to the divine history that God put in place and through the faithfulness of God to bring about and the fulfillment of his promises that we find through Jesus Christ. What did that mean for us today? It means that before we were a faint notion of a seed in our mother's womb, God put a plan in place for us to be able to come boldly to his throne by orchestrating the birth of his son, Jesus Christ, that went all the way back to King David, which can be tracked all the way back to Adam who actually led to the fall, to bring us all the way through to his son, Jesus Christ, who allowed us to get up and follow him. Amen. Brothers and sisters, until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine upon you and be uh, gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. I'm Minister Adam, and you be blessed.